Hey everyone, this is Reshma from Edureka, and in today's tutorial, we're going to focus on Hadoop. Thank you all the attendees for joining today's session. I hope that you'll all enjoy this session, but before I begin, I want to make sure that you all can hear me properly, so kindly drop me a confirmation on the chat window so that I can get started. Alright, so I've got a confirmation from Kanika, Neha, Keshav, there's Jason, Sebastian. Okay. So we'll start by looking at the topics that we'll be learning today. So we'll start by learning the big data growth drivers, the reasons because of which data has been converting into big data. Then we'll take a look at what is big data, and we'll take a look at the solution of big data, which is Hadoop. So we'll also see the master-slave architecture of Hadoop and the different Hadoop core components. We'll also study how HDFS stores data into data blocks and how the read-write mechanism works in HDFS. Then we'll understand the programming part of Hadoop, which is known as MapReduce, and we'll understand this with a MapReduce program. We'll understand the entire MapReduce job workflow, and we'll see the Hadoop ecosystem, the different tools that the Hadoop ecosystem comprises of. And finally, we'll take in a use case where we'll see how Hadoop has solved all the big data problems in real life. So I hope that the agenda is clear to everyone. All right then, it seems that everyone is clear with the agenda. So We'll get started and we'll begin with the big data growth drivers. Now the reasons behind the growth of big data could be numerous. Ever since the enhancement of technology, data has also been growing every day. Now if you go back in time, like in 70s or 80s, not many people were using computers. There were only a fraction of people who were dealing with computers and that's why the data fed into computer systems was also quite less. But now everyone owns a gadget, everyone has a mobile phone, everyone owns a laptop, and they are generating data from there every day. You can also think of Internet of Things as a factor. Nowadays we are dealing with smart devices, we have smart appliances that are interconnected and they form a network of things which is nothing but Internet of Things. So these smart appliances are also generating data when they are trying to communicate with each other. And one prominent factor behind the rise of big data that comes to our mind is social media. We have billions of people on social media because we human, we are social animals and we love to interact. We love to share our thoughts and feelings and social media website provides us just the platform that we need. And we have been using it extensively every day. So if you look at the stats in front of your screen, so you can see that in Facebook, the user generates almost 4 million likes every 60 seconds. Similarly on Twitter, there is almost 300,000 tweets every 60 seconds. On Reddit, there is 18,000 user cast votes. On Instagram, there are more than 1 million likes. And on YouTube, there is almost 300 hours of new video uploaded every 60 seconds. Now this is data for every 60 seconds. You can imagine the kind of data that we are dealing with every day and how much data we have accumulated throughout the years ever since the social media website have started. Now that's a lot of data and it has been rising exponentially over years. So let's see what Cisco has to tell about this. Now you all know that Cisco is one of the biggest networking companies and they have monitored the data traffic they have been getting over years. And they have published this on their white paper, which they publish every year. And we can see from here the stats that they have provided that by 2020, we'll be dealing with 30.6 exabytes of data. Now, one exabyte is 10 raised to the power 18 bytes. Now, that's a lot of zeros that even you can think of. In 2015, if you see that we were only dealing with 3.7 exabytes, and now in just five years, we're going up to 30.6 exabytes. Now it can be more in the coming years because the data has been rising exponentially and we are dealing with a lot of data now. And Cisco has also mentioned the three major reasons because of the rise of the data. Now the first one is adapting to smarter mobile devices. Now gone are the days when we are using phones like Nokia 1100 which was able to only call people and to receive calls and just send a few lines of text messages. Nowadays, everyone is using smartphones and we are using different apps in our phones. So each of the app is generating a lot of data. The next reason that they have mentioned is defining cell network advances. Now earlier we had 2G, now we have come with 3G and 4G and we're looking forward to 5G. Now 
through time, we are advancing in the cellular network technology also. And it has made us feasible for us to communicate even faster and in a better way. And that's why, since I already told you that we love to share things, it has become very easy for us to send a message or send videos or any kind of files to our friend who is even countries apart. And it takes only a few seconds, not even seconds, a milliseconds for that person to receive that message. And that is why we're using it extensively because of the ease of the use that we are getting provided. And the next reason that they have mentioned is reviewing tiered pricing. Now the network companies are also providing you with a lot of data plans that your entire family can use. Now we have unlimited data plans and shared plans, which is very feasible for us again, and that's why we're using it extensively. So there are a lot of mobile users nowadays. Now the stats also say that we have 217 new users every 60 seconds. So you can imagine that almost out of the world population, almost everyone uses a mobile phone now. Well, almost. So you can say that we are dealing with a lot of data and that is why the name comes as big data. So now let us see what is big data. Now as the name goes big and data, you already understood that it is a large cluster of data that we are dealing with. But if you'd ask me, I see it as a problem statement that surrounds the incapabilities of our traditional system to process it. So when the traditional systems were created, we never thought that we'll have to deal with such amount of data and such kind of data. So they are unable to process this amount of data that is being generated and with such a high speed. And that's why big data is a problem because the traditional system are not able to store the big data and process it. Now since I told you that big data is a problem, so IBM have suggested five V's in order to identify a big data problem. And those are in front of your screen. So the first one is volume. So it implies that the amount of data the client is using is so huge that it becomes increasingly difficult for the client or customer to store the data into the traditional systems. And then is the time that we should approach for a solution. And the next V we'll talk about is variety. Now we already know that we are dealing with huge volume of data, with exabytes of data, but these are coming from a variety of sources. Now we're dealing with mp3 files, we're dealing with video files, images, JSON. Now they are of all different kinds. So the mp3 files and video files, they are all unstructured data. JSON files are semi-structured and there are some structured data as well. But the major problem is that most of the data, almost 90% of the data is unstructured. So should we just dump all those unstructured data or should we make use of it? Obviously we should make use of it because those unstructured data that we are talking about, because in Facebook we mostly share photos, videos which are unstructured, those are very important data because these are used by companies to make business decisions that is gained by insights. So this data provide the companies an opportunity to, to profile their customers because in Facebook you go around liking different pages and that is profiling because now the company knows that what kind of things you like and they could approach you by advertising because in Facebook you can see that when you're browsing onto your news feed on the right hand side there are certain ads popping up and you'll find out that those ads are also user specific. They know what kind of things you like because you have browsed through different pages on Facebook, on Google or many other websites. So that is why these unstructured data which comprises of the 90% of data is very very important. And this is also a problem because our traditional systems are incapable of processing this unstructured data. The next V that comes up is velocity. So let's talk about the web service to understand this case. So if you create a web service and you provide the web service for clients to access, so how many events the web service can handle at a point of time? So you can say maybe 1,000 or 2,000. So generally there will be almost 2,000 live connections at any point of time on an average. And normally there is always a restriction to the number of live connections available at that point. So you suppose that your company has a threshold of 500 transactions at a point of time and that is your upper limit. But today you cannot have the amount of number in the big data world. You talk about sensors, you talk about machines that is continuously sending you information like GPS is continuously sending you the information to somebody. You're talking about millions and billions of events tracked per second on real time. 
So you need some extended capabilities which withstand that amount of velocity that data is getting dumped into your traditional systems. So if you think that the velocity can be a challenge to your customer, then you propose them again a big data solution because this is again a big data problem. Now the next V that we'll talk about is value. Now if your data set cannot give you the necessary information which you can use to gain insights and develop your business, then it's just garbage to you because it is very important that you have the right data and you can extract the right information from out of it. Now there might be unnecessary data lying around in your data set that is unnecessary for you. Now you'll also have to be able to identify which data set will give you the value that you need in order to develop your business. So that is again a problem in order to identify the valuable data and hence it is again a big data problem. And finally we'll talk about veracity. So veracity talks about the sparseness of data. So in simple words, veracity says that you cannot expect the data to be always correct or reliable in today's world. You might get few data which has missing values. You may have to work with various types of data that is incorrect or data which may not always hold true. So in other words, veracity means that you have to trust and make the system to have an understanding that the data may not always be correct and up to the standards. It is up to you as an application developer that you have to integrate the data and flush out those data that does not make any sense and extract only those data that make sense to you and use those data for making decision at the end. So these are the five V's that will help you to identify a big data problem whether your data is big data or not and then you can find the approach for a solution for it. So this was an introduction to big data. So now we'll understand the problems of big data and how you should approach for a solution for it with a story that you can relate to. So I hope that you'll find this part very interesting. So this is a very typical scenario. So this is Bob and he has opened up a very small restaurant in a city and he has hired a waiter for taking up orders and this is the chef who cooks all those orders and finally delivers them to the customers. Now what happens here is that this is the cook and he has access to a food shelf and this is where he gets all the ingredients from in order to cook a particular dish. Now this is the traditional scenario. So he's getting two orders per hour and is able to cook two dishes per hour. So it's a happy situation for him. So he's cooking happily, the customers are getting served because there are only two orders per hour and he has got all the time, he has got access to the food shelf also. It's a happy day. Similarly, if you compare the same scenario with your traditional processing system, so data is also being generated at a very steady rate and all the data that is being generated is also structured, which is very easy for our traditional system to process it. So it's a happy day for the traditional processing system too. Now let us talk about a different day. So this is the other scenario. So Bob decided to take online orders now. And now they are receiving much more orders than expected. So from two orders per hour, now the orders have rise to 10 orders per hour. And now he has to cook 10 dishes every hour. So this is quite a bad situation for the cook because he's not capable of cooking 10 dishes every hour where beforehand he was only doing two dishes every hour. So now consider the scenario of our traditional processing system too. So there are huge number and huge variety of data that is being generated at alarming rate. Now I've already seen the stats that I just showed you that in every 60 seconds how much data is being generated. So the velocity is really high and they are all unstructured data and our traditional processing system is not capable of doing that. So it's a bad day for our processing system too. So now what should be the solution for it? So I would ask you guys so what should Bob do right now in order to service customers without delay? Alright, so I'm getting some answers. So Sebastian is saying that Bob should hire more cooks. And exactly Sebastian, you are correct. So the issue was that there were too many orders per hour. So the solution would be hire multiple cooks. And that is exactly what Bob did. So he hired four more cooks and now he has five cooks and all the cooks have access to the food shelf. This is where they all get their ingredients from. So now there are multiple cooks cooking food even though there are 10 orders per hour. Maybe each cook is taking two orders every hour and they're serving people. 
but there are issues still there. Now because there is only one food shelf and there might be situations like both of the cooks, maybe let's say these two cooks want the same ingredient at the same time and they are fighting over it or and the other cooks have to wait until one of the cooks have taken all the ingredients from the food shelf and by that time maybe he has got something on the stove and it has already burned because he was waiting for the other cook to go so that he can get his hands on the ingredient that he wants. So again, it is a problem. So now let us consider the same situation with our traditional processing system. So now we have got multiple processors in order to process all the data which was being problematic. So it should solve the problem, right? But again, there is a problem because all these processing units are accessing data from a single point, which is the data warehouse. So bringing data to processing generates a lot of network overhead. There would be a lot of input-output overhead and there would be a network congestion because of that. And sometimes there might be also situations like processing unit is downloading data from the data warehouse and the other units have to wait in queue in order to access that data. And this will completely fail when you want to perform near real-time processing when situations are like this. That is why this solution will fail too. So then, what should be the solution? So can I get a few answers? Okay, so Keisha says that it should be distributed and parallel. You are right, Keshav. So since the food shelf was becoming a bottleneck for Bob, so the solution was to provide a distributed and parallel approach. So we'll see how Bob did that. So as a solution, what Bob did is that he divided up an order into different tasks. So now let us consider the example of meat sauce. Let's say that a customer has come into Bob's restaurant and he has ordered a meat sauce. So what happens in Bob's kitchen now is that each of the chefs have got different tasks. So let's say in order to prepare meat sauce, this chef over here, he only cooks meat. And this chef over here, he only cooks sauce. And he has also hired a head chef in order to combine the meat and the sauce together and finally serve the customer. So this cooks cook the meat and these two cooks prepare the sauce. And they are doing this parallelly at the same time. And finally, this head chef merges the order and the order is completed. Now if you remember that the food shelf was also a bottleneck. So what Bob did in order to solve this is that he distributed the food shelf in such a way that each chef has got his access to his own shelf. So this shelf over here holds all the ingredients that this chef might need and similarly he has got three more shelves that has got the same ingredients. Now again let's say that we have a problem that one of the cooks falls sick. So in that case, we don't have to worry much since we have got another cook who can also cook meat. So we can tackle this problem very easily. And similarly, let's say there comes another problem where a food shelf breaks down and this cook over here has no access to ingredients. So again, we don't have to worry since there are three more shelves and at that time of disaster, we have a backup of three more shelves so he can go ahead and use the ingredients from any of the shelves over here. So basically we have distributed and made parallel the whole process or task into smaller tasks. And now there is no problem in Bob's restaurant. He is able to serve his customers happily. And let me relate this situation with Hadoop wherein let us consider where I've told you that each of the chef has got its own food shelf. In Hadoop terms, this is known as data locality. It means that data is locally available into the processing units. And this whole thing where all the different tasks of cooking meat and sauce are happening parallelly, this is known as map in Hadoop terms. And when they're finally merged together and finally we have got a meat sauce as a dish by the head chef, this is known as reduce. And we'll be learning map reduce in Hadoop later on in this tutorial. Don't get confused with the terms. If I'm speaking it right now and you're not able to understand it, you'll be clear at this end of this tutorial. I promise you that. So now he is able to handle all the 10 online orders per hour and even at times, let's say on Christmas or New Year, even if Bob is getting more customers, more than 10 orders per hour, this system that he has developed, it is scalable. He can hire more chefs, more head chefs in that case in order to serve more orders per hour. So this is a scalable system so he can scale up and scale down whenever he needs. He can hire more chefs, he can fire more chefs whenever he needs. 
So this is the ultimate solution that Bob had and this is very effective indeed. But now, Bob has solved all his problems, but have we solved all the problems? Do we have a framework like that who can solve all the big data problems of storing it and processing it? Well, the answer is yes. We have something called Apache Hadoop and this is the framework to process big data. So let us go ahead and see Apache Hadoop in detail. So Hadoop is a framework that allows us to store and process large data sets in parallel and distributed fashion. Now you know that there were two major problems in dealing with big data. The first one was storage. So in order to solve the storage problem of big data, we have got HDFS. Because like how Bob solved the food shelf problem by distributing it among the chefs, similarly Hadoop solves the storing of big data with HDFS, which stands for Hadoop Distributed File System. So now all the big amount of data that we are dumping, it gets distributed over different machines. And these machines are interconnected on which our data is getting distributed and in Hadoop terms it is called a Hadoop cluster. And again like how Bob has managed to divide the task among his chefs and made the serving process quite quicker, similarly in order to process big data we have something called MapReduce. And this is the programming unit of Hadoop. So this allows a parallel and distributed processing of data that is lying across our Hadoop cluster. So every machine in the Hadoop cluster, it processes the data that it's got and this is known as map. Finally, when the intermediary outputs are combined in order to provide the final output, this is called reduce and hence map reduce. So now let us understand the Hadoop architecture which is a master-slave architecture and we'll understand it by taking a very simple scenario which I'm very sure that you'll all relate to very closely. So this is the scenario which is usually found in every other company. So we have a project manager here and this project manager handles a team of four people. So the four people here in our example are John, James, Bob and Alice. So whatever project he gets from a client, he distributes it across his team members and he tracks a report of how the work is going on from time to time. So now let us consider that the project manager over here, he has received four projects from a client. So let's say the projects are A, B, C and D and he has assigned all these projects across the team. So John has got project A, James has got project B, Bob has got C, Alice has got D. So everyone is handling and working on a different project and the work is going on fine. So he's quite sure that he'll be able to meet the deadlines and deliver the project in time. But there is a problem. Bob applied for a leave and he tells the project manager that I'm going on leave for a week or two and I won't be coming in office and I can't do the work. And now it is a problem for the project manager because at the end he is liable for the work that has not been completed to the client. So this person has to make sure that all the projects are delivered in time. So he thinks of a plan because he is a very clever fellow. So in order to tackle this problem, what the project manager does, he goes to John and he tells him, hey John, how are you doing? And John says, yeah, I'm doing great. Yeah, I heard that you were doing really great and you're doing excellent in your project. The John said things that something's fishy, why is he appreciating me so much today? Then the project manager goes ahead and tells him, that, John, since you're doing so well, why don't you take up the project C as well? And then John thinks, okay, that's it. And then he replies back to the manager that, no, I'm fine with my project that I've got. I have a lot of work to do already. I don't think I can take project C. Then the project manager says, no, 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 you've got me wrong. You don't have to work on project C. You know that Bob is already working on project C. Well, you can keep it as your backup project. And you might never know that you might not have to even work at the end at project C. But you'll get the credit for both the projects at the end. And I could refer you for a substantial hike. And then John thinks it's a quite good deal, he might not even have to work on it and he'll get a hike for that. So that's why he agrees and he takes up project C. So now the project manager has done his job, he doesn't have to worry about completing project C even if Bob is going out of town. And this is a very very clever fellow. In order to tackle even future problems, what he does, he goes to each of the members and tells them the same thing. And hence, now he has got a backup for all the different projects. So if any of the members ever even opt out of the team, he has got a backup. 
and this is how a project manager completes all his tasks at the given time and the client is satisfied. And then he also makes sure that he has updated his list as well in order to know who is carrying the backup projects as well. And this is exactly what happens in Hadoop. So we have got a master node that supervises the different slave nodes. The master node keeps a track report of all the processing that is going on in slave nodes. And in case of disaster, if any of the slave node goes down, the master node has always got a backup. Now if we compare this whole office situation to our Hadoop cluster, this is what it looks like. So this is the master node, this is the project manager in case of our office, and these are the processing units where the work is getting carried out. So this is exactly how Hadoop processes and Hadoop manages big data using the master-slave architecture. So understand more about the master node and the slave nodes in detail later on in this tutorial. So any doubts still now? All right, so now we'll move ahead and we'll take a look at the Hadoop core components and we're going to take a look at HDFS first, which is the distributed file system in Hadoop. So at first, let's take a look at the two components of HDFS since we're already talking about master and slave nodes. So let us take a look at what is name node and data node. So these are the components you'll find in HDFS. So since we're already talking about a master-slave architecture, so the master node is known as the name node and the slave nodes are known as data node. So the name node over here, this maintains and manages all the different data nodes, which are slave nodes, just like how our project manager manages a team. And like how you guys report to your manager about your work progress and everything, the data nodes also do the same thing by sending signals, which are known as heartbeats. Now this is just a signal to tell the name node that the data node is alive and working fine. Now coming to the data node. So this is where your actual data is stored. So remember when you talked about storing data in a distributed fashion across different machines? So this is exactly where your data is distributed across and it is stored in data blocks. So the data node over here is responsible for managing all your data across data blocks. And these are nothing but these are slave demons and the master daemon is the name node. But here you can see another component over here which is the secondary name node. And by the name you might be guessing that this is just a backup for the name node, like when the name node might crash so this will take over, but actually this is not the purpose of secondary name node. The purpose is entirely different and I'll tell you what is that. So you just have to keep patience for a while and I'm very sure that you'll be intrigued to know about how important the secondary name node is. So now let me tell you about the secondary name node. Well, since we're talking about metadata, which is nothing but information about our data, it contains all the modifications that had took place across the Hadoop cluster or our HDFS namespace. And this metadata is maintained by HDFS using two files. And those two files are FS image and edit log. Now let me tell you what are those. So FS image, this file over here, this contains all the modifications that have been made across your Hadoop cluster ever since the name node was started. So let's say if the name node was started 20 days back, so my FS image will contain all the details of all the changes that happened in the past 20 days. So obviously you can imagine that there will be a lot of data contained in this file over here and that is why we store the FS image on our disk. So you'll find this FS image file in the local disk of your name node machine. Now coming to edit log, so this file also contains metadata, that is the data about your modifications, but it only contains the most recent changes. Let's say whatever modifications that took place in the past one hour. And this file is small and this file resides in the RAM of your name node machine. So we have the secondary name node here which performs a task known as checkpointing. Now what is checkpointing? It is the process of combining the edit log with the FS image. And how is it done? So the secondary name node over here has got a copy of the edit log and the FS image from the name node and then it adds them up in order to get a new FS image. So why do we need a new FS image? We need an updated file of the FS image in order to incorporate all the recent changes also into our FS image file. And why do we need to incorporate it regularly? Let's say that if you're maintaining all the modifications in your edit log, you know that your edit log resides in your RAM. 
So you cannot let your edit log file to grow bigger because as time passes you'll be making more modifications and more changes and this will get stored in the edit log only first. So that's why if the file gets bigger it might end up taking a lot of space in your RAM and will make the processing power of the name node quite slower. And also during the time of failure let's say that your name node has failed and you want to set up a new name node, you've got all the files that is needed in order to set up a new name node. You've got the most updated recent copy of the FS image, all the metadata that you need about your data nodes that your name node is managing. So that will be found in your secondary name node and that's why your failure recovery time will grow much lesser and then you'll not lose much data or much time in order to set up a new name node. And by default the checkpointing happens every hour. And by the time when the checkpoint is happening, you might be making some more changes also. So those changes are stored in a new edit log. And until the next checkpoint happens, we'll be maintaining a new edit log file that will again contain all the recent changes since the last checkpoint. So this will be our edit log. Then again, when we are performing checkpoint again, so we'll take in all the modifications, all the data in this edit log, and then combine it with the last FS image that we had. So this checkpointing keeps on going on and by default it takes place every one hour. If you want the checkpointing to happen in minimum intervals, you can also do that. If you want it after a long time, you can also configure it. So we have studied about the HDFS components. We have taken a look at what is name node and how does it manage all the data nodes. We have also seen the functions of secondary name nodes now. So now let us see how all this data is actually stored in all the data nodes. So HDFS is a block structured file system and each file is divided into a block of particular size. And by default that size is 128 MB. So let us understand how HDFS stores files and data blocks with an example. So suppose a client wants to store a file which is of 380 MB. And he wants to store it in a Hadoop distributed file system. So now what HDFS will do is that it will divide up the file into three blocks because 380 MB divided by 128 MB which is the default size of each data block is approximately three. So here the first block will occupy 128 MB, the second block will also occupy 128 MB and the third block will be of the remaining size of the file which is 124 MB. So after my file has been divided into data blocks, this data blocks will be distributed across all the data nodes that is present in my Hadoop cluster. Here you can see that the first part of my file which is 128 MB is in data node 1. The next data block is in my data node 2 and my final data block is in data node 3. And if you notice the size of all the blocks are same except for the last one. So this is a 124 MB data block. And this helps Hadoop to save the HDFS space as the final block is using only that much of space that is needed to store the last part of the file. So therefore we have saved 4 MB from being wasted in this scenario. Now it may seem very little to you that we have only saved 4 MB so what's the big deal? But imagine if you are working with tens of thousands of such files how much data you can save here. So this was all about data blocks and how HDFS stores data blocks across different data nodes. And I suppose that by now you have understood that why do we need a distributed file system. So let me tell you that we have got three advantages when we are using a distributed file system. So let me explain this to you with an example. So now imagine that I have got a Hadoop cluster with four machines. So one of them is the name node and the other three are data nodes. So where the capacity of each of the data node is one terabyte. So now let's suppose that I have to store a file of three terabytes. So since all my data nodes have a capacity of one terabyte, this will be distributed, the file of 3 terabyte will be distributed across my 3 data nodes and 1 terabyte will be occupied in each data node. So now I don't have to worry about how it is getting stored, so HDFS will manage that. And if you see that this provides me with an abstraction of a single computer that is having a capacity of 3 terabytes. So that's the power of HDFS. And let me explain you the second benefit of using a distributed file system. So now consider that instead of 3 terabytes, I have to store a file of 4 terabytes. And my cluster capacity is only of 3 terabytes. So I'll add one more data node in my cluster in order to fit my requirements. And maybe later on when you need to store a file of huge size, you can go ahead and add as many machines in your cluster in order to fit all your requirements to store the file. 
So you can see that this kind of file system which is distributed is highly scalable. Now let me tell you the third benefit of using a distributed file system. Now let's consider that you have a single high-hand computer which has the processing power of processing a one terabyte data in four seconds. Now when you're distributing your file across the same single computer with the same capacity or the same processing power, you are reading that file parallelly. So instead of one, if you have got four data nodes in your cluster, so it will take one by fourth of your actual time, which we are doing with a single computer. So it will take you only one second. So basically with the help of distributed file system, we're able to distribute our large file across different machines. And we're also reducing the processing time by processing it parallelly. And because of this, we're able to save huge amount of time in processing the data. So these are the benefits of using HDFS. And now let us see that how Hadoop can cope up with the data node failure. Now you know that we are storing our data in data node, but what if a data node fails? So let us consider the same example over here. You know that I have got a file of 380 MB and I have got three data blocks which are distributed across three data nodes over here in my Hadoop cluster. So let's say the data node which contains the last part of the file, it crashes. What to do then? Now you have lost a part of your file. How will you process that file right now? Because you don't have a part of it. So what do you think could be a solution for that? So I'm getting an answer. So Keshav says that we should have backup. Yes, exactly. So the logical approach to solve this problem would be that we should have multiple copies of the data, right? And that is how Hadoop also solved it by introducing something which is known as replication factor. You all know what a replica is. Replica is nothing but a copy. And similarly, all our data blocks will also have different copies. And in HDFS, each of the data block has got three copies across the cluster. So you can see that this part of the file, which is 124 MB, this data block is present in data node 2, data node 3, and data node 4. And similarly, this is common to the other data blocks as well. So every data block will be there in my Hadoop cluster three times. Even if one of my data node gets crashed and I lose all of the data blocks that was inside the data node, I don't have to worry because there are two more copies present in the other data nodes. And we have to do that because since in Hadoop we are dealing with commodity hardwares and it is very likely that our commodity hardware will crash at some point of time. So that's why we maintain three copies. So even if two of them go out, we still have got one more. So this is how HDFS performs fault tolerance. And I have got a question from Neha. So she's asking that, do we have to go ahead and make replicas of our data blocks? Well, no, Neha, you don't have to do that. Whenever you put any kind of file, whenever you copy any file in your Hadoop cluster, your files will get replicated by default. And by default, it will have a replication factor of three. It means that every data block will be present automatically three times across your Hadoop cluster. So I hope that, Neha, you've got your answer. OK, so she is saying yes. Thank you, Neha, for the question. That was a very good question indeed. So we don't have to worry now if a data node gets crashed we have got multiple copies. And since you know the proverb that never put all your eggs in the same basket, this is very, very true in case of this scenario that we are dealing with right now. So we are not putting all our eggs in the same basket. We are putting our eggs in three different baskets right now. So even if one basket falls off and all the eggs crack open, we don't have to worry. We have enough eggs for our omelet. So I hope that you all have understood how HDFS provides fall tolerance. If you have any questions, you can go ahead and ask me, or whenever you get questions, you can ask me till this end of this session. So now let us understand what happens behind the scene when you are writing a file into the HDFS. So when you want to write a file across your Hadoop cluster, you have to go through three steps. And the first step that you should go through is the pipeline setup. So let us understand how to set up a pipeline with an example. So let's say that I have got a text file, maybe this is called example.txt, and I have divided it into two data blocks, which is block A and block B. So let us talk in terms of block A first. Let us see how to write block A across my data nodes in my HDFS. So here is the client. So the client node at first requests the name node, telling that I have got a block that I need to copy. So the name node says, 
Okay, so I'll give you the IP address of three data nodes. You can copy your file in this three data nodes. And you know that you have to copy your block three times because apparently the replication factor is three. So the name node here gives the IP address of three data nodes, data node one, four, and six to the client node. So now the client node has got the IP addresses of the three data nodes where block A will be copied. So at first, what he does, he goes and checks to data node one and ask data node one that, hey, I want to copy a block on your data node. So are you ready? And can you just go and ask data node four and six if they're ready? And the data node says, yeah, I'm ready. So I'll just go ahead and ask four and six. So now data node one goes to data node four and asks, hey, so the client is asking for you to copy block. So are you ready? Then four says, yeah, I'm ready. And then one says, okay, just go ahead and ask six if he is ready also. So four asks six, and then six is also ready. And this is how the whole pipeline is set up. So at first the block A will be copied to data node one, then data node four, and then data node six. Let's say that in situations there are no data nodes available that whatever IP address the name node gave, maybe those are not functioning or those data nodes are not working. So in that case, when the client node doesn't receive any confirmation, he goes back to the name node and says, hey, whatever IP addresses that you've given, those data nodes are not working. So would you go and give me another one? And then the name node goes on and checks that which other data nodes are available during that time and gives IP address to the client node again. So now your pipeline is ready. So your pipeline is set up now. So first it will be copied onto data node one, then data node four, and then data node six. So this is your pipeline. So now comes the second step where the actual writing takes place. So now since all the data nodes are ready to copy the block, so now the client will contact data node one first and data node one will first copy block A. So now the client will give the responsibility to data node one in order to copy the rest of the blocks in data node four and data node six. So now the data node one will contact data node four and tell that copy the block A onto yourself and ask data node six to do the same. So data node four will then copy block A and then pass the message on to data node six. And similarly, data node six will also copy the block. So now you have got three copies of the block just as we require. So this is how the writing takes place. After that, the next step is a series of acknowledgement. So now we have a pipeline and we have written our blocks onto the data nodes that we wanted to. So now the acknowledgement will take place in the reverse order as the writing. So at first data node six will give an acknowledgement to data node four that I have copied block A successfully. Then data node four will receive that acknowledgement and pass it to data node one that I have copied block A onto myself and so has data node six. So all this acknowledgement will be passed to data node one and then data node one will give an acknowledgement finally to the client node that all the three blocks have been copied successfully. And after that, the client node will send a message to the name node that the writing has been successful, that all the blocks have been copied to the data nodes one, four, and six. So the name node will receive that message and update its metadata where all the blocks are copied in which data node. So this is how the write mechanism takes place. First, a pipeline setup, then the actual writing, and then you get an acknowledgement. So now we just talked only about a single block. As I told you that my file, my example.txt file was divided into two blocks, block A and block B. The write mechanism for block B will be similar. Only when the client node will request to copy block B, he might get the IP addresses of different data nodes. For example, the block B is copied to three, seven, and nine, and block A was copied on one, four, and six. Now let me tell you that the writing process of block A and block B will happen at the same time. Now obviously I told you that the writing mechanism, it takes place in three steps. So the actual writing will happen sequentially. That means it will first get copied to the first data node, then the second, and then the third. But the blocks will be copied at the same time. So this is how the writing mechanism takes place. So the writing of the block A and block B are taking place at the same time. So 1A and 1B step is taking place at the same time. 2A and 2B step are taking place at the same time. So when the client is copying the different blocks onto different data nodes, 1A and 1B, this is taking place at the same time. And then 2A and 2B are also taking place at the same time. When the first block, the block A is getting copied onto data node 1, 
and when block B is getting copied at the data node 7. Similarly, the other steps are also taking place at the same time. As many as block your file contains, all the blocks will be copied at the same time in sequential steps onto your data nodes. So this is how the writing mechanism takes place. So now let us see what is the story behind reading a file from your different data nodes in your HDFS. So let me tell you that reading is fairly much simpler than writing a block onto your HDFS. So let's say now my client wants to read that same file that has been copied across different data nodes in my HDFS. So you know that my block A was copied onto data node 1, 4, and 6, and block B was copied onto data node 3, 7, and 9. So now my client will again request the name node that I want to read this particular file. And my name node will give the IP addresses where all my data blocks of that particular file are located. So the client node will receive that IP address and contact the data nodes. And then all the data blocks will be fetched, my data block A and my data block B will be fetched simultaneously and then it will be read by the client. So this is how the entire read mechanism takes place. So guys, this is all about HDFS. We have seen how a file is copied in your HDFS, how a file is copied across a Hadoop cluster in a distributed fashion. Then we have seen the advantages of using a distributed file system. We have also understood what is a name node and what are data nodes and how are data stored and how is your file stored and divided up into data blocks and spread across your Hadoop cluster. We have also seen that how Hadoop deals when our data node fails and they introduced a replication factor as a backup for your file. And then we have also seen how the read and write mechanism takes place. So I hope that you've all understood what is Hadoop distributed file system. If you have any questions, you can ask me. And now let us go and move on and let us check what is MapReduce. Now you already remember the example that we have given at the start of our session, a cook example, how different chefs cook different dishes at the same time and finally a head chef assembles the dish all together and finally gives the desired output. So this is what we'll be learning now. We'll be learning with more relevant examples so that you can understand MapReduce better. So let us understand MapReduce with another story which we'll find amusing again. I'm very sure about that. So let us consider a situation where we have a professor and there are four students in the class. So they are reading a Julius Caesar book. So now the professor wants to know how many times the word Julius occurs in the book. So for that he asks his students that go ahead, read the entire book and tell me how many times the word Julius is there on the book. So all of the students have got a copy of the book and they start counting the word Julius. So it took them four hours to do so. So the first student answered that I've got 45 times, the second one answers 46. Maybe he made a calculation mistake or maybe he's correct. We don't know that because we don't have the book apparently. And the third student also replies 45 and the fourth also replies 45. And then the professor decides that okay, three people can't be wrong so I have to go with the majority and majority is usually correct. So he goes with the answer that the word Julius was appeared 45 times in the entire book and it took a time of four hours. So then the professor thought that it's taking a lot of time. So this time what the professor did, he applied a different method. So let us assume that the book has got four chapters. So he distributed each chapter to each of the students. He asked the student one that you go through chapter one and tell me how many times Julius occurs in chapter one. And similarly, he gave the same task and assigned chapter two to the second student, chapter three to the third, and chapter four to the fourth. So now since they are only assigned with one chapter instead of the entire book, they are able to count the Julius word or finish up an entire chapter in just one hour. And they are doing it at the same time. So at the same time, chapter one has been counted, chapter two has been counted, chapter three has been counted, and chapter four has also been counted and everyone gave their respective answer. So this student went up to the professor and said that I found the word Julius 12 times in chapter one. And the second student said I found it 14 times in chapter two. In chapter three, he says that I found it eight times. And in chapter four, he says that I found it 11 times. So the professor received all the different answers from all the four students and finally he adds them up in order to get the answer of 45. And let's assume that it took him two minutes 
to add them up. Now, these are very small numbers, so he might not take two minutes, but we are just assuming it. So instead of four hours, now we are able to find out the correct answer in just one hour, two minutes. So this is a very effective solution. So the part where each of the students were distributed and each of them were working on a part of the book, this part is known as map. And finally, when the professor is summing up all the numbers together, this part is known as reduce. And this entirely is map reduce in the concepts of Hadoop. So all the processing of a single file is divided into parts and they are getting processed simultaneously. And finally, the reducer adds all the intermediate results and gives you the final output. And this is a very effective solution because all the tasks are happening parallelly and in a lesser time. So I hope that you have understood with this example, you have understood the essence of MapReduce with this example. So now let us go ahead and understand MapReduce in detail. So MapReduce is the programming unit in Hadoop. So this is a framework that gives us the advantage of using a distributed framework in order to process large data sets. So the MapReduce consists of two distinct tasks. So the first one is known as Map and the second task is known as Reduce. And as the name MapReduce suggests, the reducer phase takes place after the mapper phase has been completed because the reducer needs intermediate results that is produced by Map in order to combine it and finally give you the final output. So the first is the map job where a block of data is read and processed to produce key value pairs as an intermediate output. And then the output of a mapper or a map job which are nothing but key value pairs is input into the reducer. And then the reducer receives the key value pair from multiple map jobs and then it aggregates all the intermediate results and finally gives you the final output in the form of key value pairs. So this is how MapReduce takes place. We'll be understanding this in detail now. So I hope that you have all understood this. So let us move on right now and understood MapReduce with an example which is a word count program. So let us say that we have got a paragraph, we have got this much text, dear beer river, car car river, dear car beer. And we want to find out that how many times each word appear in this particular sentence or in this particular paragraph. So this is how MapReduce works. So now we have divided and since you know that we divide up the entire task into different parts, here we'll divide up each of the sentence into three because there are three sentences. So this is the first sentence, dear beer river, the second one is car car river and the third is dear car beer. So now the mapping will take place on each of the sentences over here. And since I already told you that a map job is something where a data is read and then a key value pair is formed. So we have got the key which is each of this word and then a value is assigned here which is nothing but one. So here the mapping takes place so each of them is converted into a key value pair with the word and a number one. So it happens similarly in the other two sentences as well. So first we divide up the input in three splits. As you can see in the figure over here that we have divided into three parts and the three sentences that we have in our paragraph. So the first one is dear beer river, the second one is car car river, and then dear car beer. And then we'll distribute this work among all the map nodes. So after that, in mapping what happens, we tokenize the words in each of the mapper and give a hard-coded value one. So the reason behind giving the hard-coded value one is that every word in itself will occur once. So now a list of key value pair will be created where the key is nothing but the individual word and the value is one. So after the mapper, sorting and shuffling happens so that all the keys are sent to the corresponding reducer. So after the sorting and shuffling, each of the reducer will have a unique key and a list of values corresponding to that very key. So we have got beer two times, so we have got the key beer and its value two times one and one. So now the reducer, what it will do is that it will count the values which are present in that list of values. So here, one and one is two, and then car was found three times with three one values, so car will be three, similarly deer two and river two. And finally, we'll get all the output together in a key value pair, so the reducer has combined all the different intermediate results all together here, and we have got another key value pair which gives you the final output where we can see that bear was found in our input two times, so car was three times, deer two times, and river two times. 
So this is how MapReduce occurs in Hadoop. So I hope that you have understood this word count program. So we'll also go ahead and run this program. So I'll tell you the major parts of MapReduce program. So first, you have to write the mapper code, that is how the mapping will happen, how all the distributed tasks will carry out at the same time, and how they will produce key value pairs. And then comes the reducer code. It means that how all the intermediate results, the key value pairs that we have got from each of the mapping functions, and how will we merge them. And then finally, there is the driver code. So here you specify all the job configurations, like what is the job name, the input, output path, and etc. So these are the three parts of running MapReduce in Hadoop. So now let's talk about the mapper code. So basically this is a Java program, so for those of you who know Java and have been working on Java, this is a very simple program for you all. But still let me go through and explain the logic of this entire program. So this is our mapper code, and we have a class here called map, which extends to the class mapper. And we have mentioned the data types of our input-output key value pair with respect to mapper. Now let me tell you that the mapper accepts input as a key value pair and gives output also in a key value pair form. So since we have this as an input, which is nothing but paragraphs, and we have not specified any particular key or value to it. So the mapper here itself specifies the key as the byte offset type. And the value here would be each sentence or each tuple from the entire paragraph that we are inputting into. So the data type of each of the key, which is nothing but the byte offset type, will be wrong writable since it's just a number. And how it takes the byte offset type, let me tell you, if you see the input over here, which is just a tuple, if you see that in this sentence we have got three words with four, four, and five character each and two blank spaces. And since they are all of character types and each character occupies eight bytes of memory, so if you add them up together, you get 121, and this is the next byte offset for the next tuple. So this is the data type of our byte offset type, which is wrong writable, and the input type would be each of the sentence, which is nothing but text. And if you remember, the mapper produces an output again as a key value pair, so which will have nothing but each token, which are also nothing but each of the unique words in our particular tuple, which is nothing but text and then with a tokenized value, a hard-coded value like we have done in our previous example, like we have assigned a hard-coded value 1 to each of the token, which is nothing but an integer, so this, the data type of our mapper value output would be int writable. So for this method, we have got our key as the byte offset and the value as our tuple. So we have got three tuples here and this will be performed on each of the tuples in our input. So the map method here takes the key value and context as arguments. So we have the byte offset as our key, and we have the tuple as our value, and the context will allow us to write our map output. So what we are doing here is that we are storing each of the tuple in a variable called line, and then we are tokenizing it. It means we are just breaking up our each tuple into tokens, which are nothing but each individual words present in that tuple and then we're assigning a hard-coded value 1. So each token will be our map output key along with the hard-coded value 1, and we have provided 1 as a hard-coded value just because each of the word will be at least occurring once in that particular tuple. So the output key pair value that we'll have will have something like each of the token, and then with a hard-coded value 1. So if you remember the example which we just learned a while ago, so the output for the first tuple in our example would be dear one beer one and river one so this is the entire mapper code so now let us take a look at the reducer code and even here we have got a class called reduce which extends the class reducer and you remember that the reduce takes place only after the shuffling and sorting so here the input will be nothing but the output of our shuffling and sorting and the output of shuffling and sorting was something like this which will have a word along with its frequency, or how many times it has occurred after the mapping is done. So this will be our input, and if you see, the first key, and the key here is nothing but a text, and the value here is nothing but an array, which is of the data type int writable. And finally, it produces an output with the word and how many times it has occurred. 
which is again nothing but a word and a number which is of the data type text and int writable, something like this which you can see over here. So what we are doing is that, so we have got a method called reduce. So here we have got the input key, which is nothing but a text, and the input value as an array, something like this. So now, since it is an array, we'll just run a loop and we'll sum up the number of ones for each of the token. So here, for bear, we have got two ones, so we'll just sum up these two ones and finally get the result. So the output key will be text, that is a particular word or a unique word, and the value would be the sum of all the ones that was associated in that particular array. So here we have got 1 plus 1 as 2, so the final output would be bear 2. And similarly for car, if the input was car 1, 1, 1, so we're getting car 3. So this is the whole reducer code. So remember that I've told you that there was one more section of code in the entire map reduce code. And the third part is the driver code. So this code over here, this will contain all the configuration details of our map reduce job. So for example, it will contain the name of my job, the data type of my input output of the mapper and reducer. So you can see that my job name is my word count program. And here I have mentioned the name of my class. And then the mapper class, which is known as map, the reducer class, which is reduce. And the output key class is text. So we can also set the output value of our class. And since in this example, we are dealing with the frequency of your words, which are nothing but numbers. So we have mentioned int writable. So again, if you want to set input format class, which is nothing but this is just to specify how a mapper will process a particular input file. That is what will be the unit of work for each map. And in our case, the whole input text that we had, it was processed line by line. So we can specify that as well. Similarly, we can also specify how the output format class how the output will be written onto our file, which is also line by line. And we can also go ahead and set the input path. We can mention the directory from which it will fetch our input file. And we can also go ahead and mention the output path or the directory where my file or my output will be written onto. So this is what exactly a driver code contains. This is nothing but just the configuration details of your entire MapReduce code. So I hope that you have all understood this program so we'll just go ahead and execute it. So this is my VM where I have set up my HDFS. So let's go ahead and execute the MapReduce program practically. So let me open my IDE first and for my IDE I'm using Eclipse. So this is my Java program that I just showed you. So here is my mapper code, then here is my reducer code, and this is my driver code that I just now explained it to you in detail. So I told you that the starting point is the main method and this is where my driver code resides. So I told you earlier that the starting point is the main method and this is where my driver code resides. And here you can see that we have assigned a zeroth argument for the input path and the first argument for the output path. So my class name here is word count. This is the package where my class resides in, that is in.edureka.mapreduce. And I've also imported the required Hadoop jars that is required for this program. So these are the jars. And I've also exported this whole program along with all Hadoop dependencies as a wordcount.jar. So this is the jar file which you can see over here. So this is it. So let's go ahead and run this. So for that, I'll just open up my terminal. So now let's go ahead and create a directory in order to store my input and output. So first I'll create one directory and inside that I'll create two more directories for input and output. So for that you have to use the command Hadoop FS then hyphen mkdir which is for make directory and let me call the directory as word count. And now let us go ahead and create some subdirectories for input and output. So we'll go ahead and I'll just add input over here. And similarly, let us go ahead and create the output directory as well. So I have created my directories. Now what I have to do, I have to pull the data set or the file that we're dealing with into our input directory so that Hadoop can fetch it from there and run the code. So let me just show you where my file is. So this is here in the home directory. 
So this is the file. So this is the same file that we have learned in the example, which is Dear River Car. So this is a simple paragraph over here, and we're going to perform the word count program on this text file over here, which is known as test.txt. So we'll clear the screen. So we're done with making our directories. Now our next step is to put this text file or move this text file into our HDFS directory. So for that, we'll use the command Hadoop fs hyphen put and the name of our file, which is test.txt. And our HDFS directory, which is known as word count. And we want it in our input directory. So this will move it. And now what we have to do, we have to run the jar file now in order to perform MapReduce on the test.txt file. And for that, we'll use this command, Hadoop jar, and the name of my jar is word count. And we also have to mention the name of the package. So you remember the name of the package that I showed you in the code, which is in.edureka.mapreduce. And also mention my class name where my main method is so that the execution of this MapReduce program can get started from there. So the name of my class is word count and press enter. So it is throwing this exception because if you remember in our driver code that we have mentioned that our input directory is of the zeroth argument and the output directory is of oneth argument. So but we haven't mentioned it anywhere. So we have to go ahead and mention it so that Hadoop can fetch the file from our input directory and finally store the output in my output directory. So now we'll go ahead and we'll just mention the input and output directories. So my input is in word count slash input and my output was in word count slash output. And now let us run it. So now you can see that the MapReduced execution is going on. So you can see that it has read some bytes and written some bytes. So let us go ahead and see the output. So let me just show you my output file. So for that, I'll use the command Hadoop fs hyphen ls. Then this is my directory. So you see over here that this is my output file. So let us go ahead and check that what Hadoop has written onto this output file, or let us see the MapReduce result. So for that, I'll just use the cat command. So this is the command Hadoop fs hyphen cat my directory. And slash asterisk zero. So there it is. So beer, it counted all the words and it has given you the final results. So beer four times, car three, deer two, and river three. So this is how Hadoop executes MapReduce, and this is how you can run different MapReduce programs in your system. So this is just one simple example. You can go ahead and run different programs as well. So I hope that you all have understood this. So we'll go ahead and move on to the next topic. So now let us go ahead and take a look at the YARN components. And YARN stands for Yet Another Resource Negotiator, which is nothing but MapReduce version 2. So let us take a look at the components. So we have got the resource manager, a node manager, app master, and container. So the resource manager here, again, is the main node in the processing department. So the resource manager receives processing requests like MapReduce jobs, and then it passes on the request to the node manager, and it monitors if the MapReduce job is taking place correctly or not. So the node manager over here, this is installed on every data node. So basically you can think that a node manager and the data node lies in a single machine. So this is responsible for app master and container. Now coming to containers. So the containers are nothing but this is a combination of CPU and RAM. So this is where the entire processing or the map reduce task takes place. And there we have got an app master. So the app master is assigned whenever the resource manager receives a request for a MapReduce job. So then only a app master is launched, which monitors if the MapReduce job is going on fine and reports and negotiates with the resource manager to ask for resources which might be needed in order to perform that particular MapReduce job. 
So this is again a master slave architecture where the resource manager is the master and the node manager is a slave which is responsible for looking after the app master and the container. So this is yarn. Now let us go ahead and take a look at the entire map produce job workflow. So what happens, the client node submits a map produce job to the resource manager. And since you know that resource manager is the master node, so this is where a job is submitted. And then the resource manager replies the client node with an application ID. And then the resource manager contacts the node manager and asks him to start the container. And then the node manager is responsible for launching an app master for each of the application. So the app master will negotiate for containers, that is the data node environment where the process executes. And then it will execute the specific application and monitor the progress. So the application master are nothing but daemons which reside on data node and communicates to containers for execution of tasks on each data node. So then it will receive all the resources that is needed. So then the app master will receive all the resources from the resource manager in order to complete that job and will start a container. So the app master will launch a container and when the container is launched, we'll have a yarn child which will perform the actual map reduce task and finally we'll get the output. So this is how the entire map reduce job workflow takes place. And now let us understand what happens behind the scene when a map reduce job is taking place. So this is our input block and the details in the input block will be read by the map task. And each map has a circular memory buffer that it writes the output to. And the buffer is 100 MB by default. But the size of this buffer can be tuned or changed by changing the mapreduce.task.io.sort.mb property. So when the contents of the buffer reach at a certain threshold size, and by default, when it fills up to 0.80 or let's say 80%, so a background thread will start to spill the contents to the disk. So the map outputs will be continued to be written to the buffer while the spill takes place, but if the buffer fills up during this time, the map will block until the spill is complete. So before spilling the content into disk, the thread will first divide the data into partitions corresponding to the reducers that they will ultimately be sent to. So with each partition, the background thread performs an in-memory sort by key. So each time the memory buffer reaches the spill threshold, a new spill file is created. So after the map task has written its last output record, there could be several spill files. So before the task is finished, the spill files are merged into a single partition and sorted output file. And this will be done by different mapping functions. So the configuration property mapreduce.task.io.sort.factor controls the maximum number of streams or spill files to merge at once and the default is 10. So now we'll have outputs from different other mapping functions and finally all these outputs from different maps are fetched and it is sent to the reducer for aggregation. So you can see in this image over here that I have received different intermediate results from different maps and finally they are merged together and they are sent to the reducer in order to provide the final result. So this is how MapReduce works. So I hope that you've all understood this. So any questions? All right. So we'll move on and we'll take a look at the yarn architecture. So we have already gone through the components in Yarn. So we already know that there is a resource manager, which is the master. And then we have got slave nodes again, where a node manager is present in every of the slave nodes. And the node manager is responsible for app master and container. So we've got different node managers here. So what the node manager does is that it sends the node status or how each of the node is performing a single map reduce job and it sends a report to the resource manager. And when a resource manager receives a job request or a map reduce job request from a client, what it does, it asks a node manager to launch an app master. Now, there is only one single app master for each application. So it is only launched when it gets a request or a map reduce job from the client and it is terminated as soon as the map reduce job is completed. So the app master is responsible for collecting all the resources that is needed in order to perform that map reduce job from the resource manager. So the app master asks for all the resources that it is needed and the resource manager provides it to that app master. And finally, the app master is also responsible for launching a container 
this is where the actual MapReduce job or the MapReduce processing will take place. So this is the entire YARN architecture. This is fairly simple. So I hope that you've understood this. And now let us take a look at the Hadoop architecture by combining both of these two concepts together, the Hadoop distributed file system and YARN. So if you see HDFS and YARN together, so we have got two master nodes here. So the master node in case of HDFS is name node and in YARN it is resource manager. So HDFS is only responsible for storing our big data. So we have also the secondary name node here which is responsible for checkpointing and you already know what checkpointing is. It is the process of combining the FS image with the edit log. And for st actually storing the data, we have got data node which are the worker nodes and in case of YARN, we, our worker nodes are node manager which is responsible for processing the data which is nothing but a MapReduce job. So you can also see that a data node and a node manager, they basically reside on a single machine. So this is HDFS and YARN all together. So I hope that you've all understood HDFS and YARN. So you all now know how data is stored in Hadoop and how it is processed in Hadoop. So now let us take a look at how a Hadoop cluster actually looks like. So this is how a Hadoop cluster looks like. So we have got different racks together that contains different nodes, master and slave nodes all together. So these are nothing but different cluster. So all these machines are interconnected and they're connected with a switch. In this particular rack, we have got the master node, the name node, the secondary name node and different slave nodes. We can also combine small clusters together in order to obtain a big Hadoop cluster all together. So this is a very simple diagram that shows you what a Hadoop cluster looks like. So now let us see how you can launch different Hadoop cluster or the different modes of Hadoop cluster. Okay, we'll start from the bottom. So we'll start with multi-node cluster mode. So the previous image that I've just shown you is a multi-node cluster mode. So let me just go back and show it to you again. So this is a Hadoop multi-node cluster. So we have got multiple nodes over here. We've got name nodes, which are master nodes and worker nodes on different machines. So this is a multi-node cluster. And then we have got pseudo distributed mode. So it means that all the Hadoop daemons, the master daemon and the slave daemon, they run on the local machine. And then we have got a standalone or local mode. It means that there are no daemons, everything is running on a single virtual machine. So this is only suitable when you are just going to try out Hadoop. You want to see that how Hadoop works. So this is only for that. But this completely violates our concept of having a distributed file system because it is not distributed at all when you have only a single machine. But in zero distributed, the difference is that you can have virtualization inside. Even though the hardware is same, you can still have logical separations. But this is also not advisable to use since if that machine goes down, your entire Hadoop cluster or your entire Hadoop setup would be lost. So you can go ahead and set up your Hadoop cluster in a pseudo distributed mode when you want to learn Hadoop, when you want to see how the files get distributed and you want to get a first-hand experience on Hadoop you can go ahead and set up your Hadoop cluster in a single machine by logically partitioning it. But when you talk about production, you should always go ahead with multi-node cluster mode. You should divide up the task and that is how exactly you'll get the benefits out of big data. Because unless you distribute the task and unless all the tasks are performed parallelly by different machines, by also having a backup plan or by having a backup storage or by having a backup node or backup machine for processing it, when a single machine goes down, you won't get the proper benefits of using Hadoop. So that's why for production purpose, you should always go ahead with multi-node cluster mode. So this was all about Hadoop clusters. So now let us go ahead and see the Hadoop ecosystem. So this is the Hadoop ecosystem. And this is nothing but a set of tools which you can use for performing big data analytics. So let's start with Flume and Scoop, which are used for ingesting data into HDFS. Now, I already told you that data has been generating at a very high velocity. So in order to cope up with the velocity, we use tools like Flume and Scoop in order to ingest the data into our processing system or our storage system. Because it is getting generated at a very high rate, so Flume and Scoop acts like a funnel in order to store the data for some time and then ingest it accordingly. So Flume is used to ingest unstructured and semi-structured data which are nothing but mostly social media data and Scope is used to ingest structured data like Excel sheets, Google sheets, something like that. 
and you already know what HDFS is. This is a distributed file system which is used for storing big data. We have also discussed about YARN which is nothing but yet another resource negotiator. This is meant for processing big data. And apart from that we have got many other tools in our Hadoop ecosystem. So we have got Hiveir. Now Hive is used for analytics. So it was developed by Facebook and it uses Hive query language which is very similar to SQL. So when Facebook developed Hive and when they wanted to start using it, so they didn't have to hire people who knew HQL because they could already use the people who are experts in SQL and this is very similar to that. Now we have got another tool for analytics which is PIG. Now PIG is really powerful and one PIG command is almost equal to 20 lines of MapReduce code. So obviously when you run that PIG command, that one line PIG command, the compiler implicitly converts it into a MapReduce code but you have to only write one single PIG command and it will perform analytics on your data. So we've got Spark over here which is used for near real-time processing. And for machine learning we've got two more tools, the Spark ML Lib and Mahout. So again we've got tools like Zookeeper and Embari which is used for management and coordination. So Apache Embari is a tool for provisioning, managing and monitoring the Apache Hadoop clusters. And over here Uzi is a workflow scheduler system in order to manage Apache Hadoop jobs and this is very scalable, reliable and an extensible system. Then Apache Storm, this is used for real-time computation which is free and open source. And with Storm it is very easy to reliably process unbounded streams of data. Then we've also got Kafka which handles real-time data feeds and we've got Solar Lucent which is used for searching and indexing. So these are the set of tools in Hadoop ecosystem and according to your need you need to select the best tools and come up with the best possible solution. So you don't have to use all the tools at the same time. So this was Hadoop ecosystem. So any questions or doubts? All right. So now let us take a look at a use case to understand how we can use Hadoop for big data analytics in real life. And we'll understand it by taking into account and analyzing our Olympic data set. So let us see what we're going to do with this data set and how this data set looks like. So we have an Olympic data set and we're going to use a Hadoop tool which is known as PIC in order to make some analysis about this data set. Now let me tell you a little bit about PIC before going ahead with this use case. So PIC is a very powerful and a very popular tool that has been widely used for big data analytics. And with PIC you can write complex data transformations without the knowledge of Java. You saw the earlier program that we wrote that was fairly simple. This was just a small MapReduce program but it had almost 70 to 80 lines of Java code and if you're not good at Java it might be a little hard for you. So now you don't have to worry because we have got PIG and PIG uses its own language which is known as PIG Latin and this is very much similar to SQL. And PIG also has various built-in operators for joining, filtering, sorting to process large sets of data. And also let me tell you a very interesting fact that 10 lines of PIG code is almost equal to 200 lines of MapReduce code. So that is why PIG is so popular because it is very easy to learn and it is very easy with PIG to deal with large data sets. So now we have got the Olympic data set. Now this is fairly small but just for an example let me show you and let me tell you what we're going to do with this data set. So these are the things that we're going to make analysis about the Olympic data set. So at first we're going to find the list of top 10 countries that have won the highest medals. And then we're going to see the total number of gold medals won by each country. And we'll also find out which countries have won the most number of medals in a particular sport which is swimming. So this is what we're going to find out. And now let us take a look at our data set. So this is a brief description of my data set. So I've got these fields in my data set. So the first field is athlete and this consists of the name of the athlete. Then we have got the age of the athlete, the country which an athlete belongs to, the year of Olympics when the athlete played, the closing date is the date when the ending ceremony was held for that particular Olympic year, the sport which an athlete is associated to, the number of gold medals won by him or her, number of silver medals, number of bronze medals 
and the total medals won by a particular athlete. And this is what our data set looks like. So here is athlete, and this is the field athlete, and it contains the name of the athletes like Michael Phelps, Natalie Kuglin, Alexei Nemov, then the age of the athletes, the country, the United States, the year, 2008, the closing ceremony date, this is the date, the sport is swimming, gold medals, eight, silver medal, zero, bronze medal, zero, total medals, eight. So this is how our data set looks like and we're going to perform some operations on this data set in order to make some analysis and some insights using PIG. So let us go ahead and let me show you how to do that. So this is my terminal where I have got my Hadoop set up and we're going to use PIG for that. So now I have already loaded my data set in my HDFS. So let me just show you where my data set actually lies. So Hadoop FS hyphen LS. So these are my input and output directories. So let us go ahead, use PIG and make this analysis. So all my results will be stored over here and I'll go ahead and show it to you once we perform all the operations. So the first thing that we're doing, we're going to find the list of top 10 countries with highest medals. So let me go ahead and open PIG. So this is the shell for PIG. So the first thing that we need to do, we need to load the data set into PIG. So for that, I'm going to use a variable. I'm going to store the data set in this variable. And this is the command that I'm using, which is load. And then you have to mention the name of the directory, which is Olympic slash input. And you also have to mention the name of your data set, which is Olympics underscore data. And it is a CSV file. After that, you have to write using pick storage. And we're going to use a delimiter sign T. Now I'll tell you why. Because if you remember in our data set, all of the fields that we have, they are separated by using a tab. And that's why we have used slash T as our delimiter here. And make sure that after you end each line of big code, you end it with a semicolon, just like how you do in SQL. Now press enter. Now let us go check out this variable Olympic. So for that, you can use this command, dump, and the name of the variable. So my data set has been loaded. So this is it. So here we have got all the fields mentioned. We have got the name of each of the player, the age, the country where they belong to, the year of the Olympics, the closing date ceremony, the sport each of these athletes are associated to, the number of gold medals, silver, bronze, and total medals. So my entire data set has been loaded into the variable Olympic. So if you remember what we're going to do, we're going to find the list of top 10 countries with the highest medals. So we don't need all the fields here. We just need the field where we have got the country name and the total medals. So for that, I'll write one more code, but first I'll clear the screen. So I'm going to use another variable here, so let us call it country final, and let me write the code. So let me say for each Olympic, generate to as country as total medals. Now these numbers that you see $2 and 9, these are index. So let me go back to our data set and let me show you why I have mentioned 2 and 9 here. So this is our data set and the index of all the fields, it starts from 0. So athlete is at 0th index, age is at 1, country is at 2, and total medals is at 6. So we only need the country and the total medals. And that's why we've mentioned the indexes of the country field and the total medals field only. So now let us go ahead and execute this. Let us go check this variable. So this is our another intermediate result. So you can see all the countries are present and there is a hard-coded value 1. So you can see that now all the countries, we have got one Ukraine here and two over here. So what we want to do now, we want to group all the same countries together. So for that, we'll use this. So again, I'm using a variable to group all the countries together. I'm calling it grouped, so and then execute this command. 
so group country final by country now let us check grouped So now you can see all the same countries are grouped together. So you've got Trinidad and Tobago here, Serbia and Montenegro, Czech Republic. So all the countries are grouped together. So this result is also intermediate. If you remember in the previous MapReduce program, we also got a similar value like this. And then what we did, we counted it and finally gave the final result. And that is exactly what we're going to do now. And let me tell you also that each pick code that you run, it gets implicitly transformed or it gets implicitly translated into a MapReduce code only. So whatever is happening, we did the similar thing in our previous code also. So now we'll go ahead and we'll count them. So now let me use another variable to store the results. So let me call it final result. And this is the command. So for each grouped generate group and in order to count it we're going to use an inbuilt function in pick which is called count and here we're using our country final and total medals as f count now let us go check the final result And there it is. So South Korea has got 274 total medals. Puerto Rico has two. North Korea has 21. Venezuela has four. But if you see it right now, this is not in a sorted order. And we won the top 10. So let us sort it so that we can have the highest medal winners on the top. Clear it. So in order to sort it, I'm going to use this variable. I'm going to store the sorted result in this variable called sort. And now I'm going to write, and I want to order the final result. By F count, and I want it in the descending order. Now let us go check sort. So now we have got all the countries in a sorted manner. So if you scroll up, we can see that United States has got the highest medals. Then comes Russia, Germany, Australia, China. But I have got the list of all the countries with me. And I wanted only the top 10 countries. So I will eliminate all the others and I will just select the top 10. So for that, let me use another variable to store the names of the top 10 countries only. And let me call it final count. And let me use this limit sort 10. Now it'll give me only the top 10 values. Now let us go check final count. So this is our final result. We have got the name of the top 10 countries with the total number of medals a particular country won. And so this is our final result. So let's go ahead and store this result in our output directory. So for that, I'll use this command, store final count into the name of your directory, which is Olympic slash output. And let me store it in a particular file. So let me call it use case first. And it's a success. So the final result has been successfully stored in a file in my output directory. Similarly, we can go ahead and find out the answers to the other two questions that we already had. So the second one was to find the top 10 countries that won the highest number of gold medals. Now this is completely similar to the first one that we did. Only instead of selecting the field with total medals, we'll select the field for gold medals this time. And apart from that, all other steps will be same. 
So the gold medals will be in the sixth index. Instead of writing nine, we should write six in this case. And the third one was to find out which countries have won the most number of medals in swimming. So let me go ahead and execute you this one. So this is also very, very similar again. Instead of just two, we have to select three fields because there is one more field, which is the sport field involved in this one. So let me just go ahead and run the same commands. So the first thing that we need to do, we have to load our data set. So it's the same. So we have loaded this. And now for the second one, now the second one, instead of two fields, we have to select three fields. So generate two as a country, this is fine. We'll add another one, the sport was in the fifth index. So I'll go ahead and mention that. So 5S sport and 9 as total medals. And this time, since we want it for a particular sport, which is swimming, so we'll filter out all other sports and we'll only take into account swimming. But first, let me clear my screen. So I'm using another variable. So let me call it athletes filter. And I'm going to use another inbuilt function for that, which is known as filter. So I'm going to filter country final by sport. And the sport is swimming. So now let us go ahead and check athletes filter. So there we have, we have got only the country name, the sport swimming. Now again, this is another intermediate result. We want to group all the countries together again. So for that, let me use this variable called final group. And we'll use another inbuilt function, which is called group. Athletes filter by country. Let's go and check out final group. So again, we have grouped all the countries together. Now we'll go ahead and count it. And now we'll go ahead and we'll use the similar count function that we did before. So let me use another variable over here. Let me again call it final count. Make sure you have a space here. So for each final group, generate group and use the count function and you mention athletes filter. Now let's go ahead and check final count. Again, it's not sorted and we want to see the top country who always win medals in swimming. So again, we'll go ahead and sort it. So sort, order, final count by F count and I want the top country first so I'll sort it in descending order. So let me go ahead and check out sort. So there we have so I know you guys already guessed it, so it's obviously going to be United States and Michael Phelps won it all. So yeah, so we've got United States on the top, then we've got Australia, Netherlands, Japan, China, Germany, France. Now if you want 
only the top five or top ten, you can do it in a similar way by using limit. So, but if you want to keep it this way, you can do that. So now this is the final result that we want, and we're going to store it in our output directory. So again, we'll use the same command, store sort in my output directory, which is again Olympic slash output and let me just store it in a file called use case I'll give us three and enter and so again this was successful now let's come out of the big shell now this is my terminal and now let us view the first result that we have got and we have stored it in our output directory so for that type Hadoop fs hyphen cat my output directory so it was in this file use case first and asterisk zero so there is my result it was successfully stored in my output directory and there it is. So this is how you can use PIG in order to make analysis. Now this was a very small data set and very easy analytics that we make. You can perform some very complex ones also using PIG and you just have to write only a few lines of code. So I hope that you all have understood this use case. If you have any doubts, you can ask me questions right now. So do you have any questions? All right. Thank you everyone for attending this session. I hope that you've all learned about Hadoop. But if you have any queries or any doubts, kindly leave it on the comment section below. This video will be uploaded on your LMS. And I'll see you next time. Till then, happy learning. I hope you enjoyed listening to this video. Please be kind enough to like it. And you can comment any of your doubts and queries. And we will reply to them at the earliest. Do look out for more videos in our playlist. And subscribe to our Edureka channel to learn more. Happy learning.